Yes, so I didn't quit my PhD 20 years ago. I decided I wasn't useless and it was somebody else. Um, uh, so I have been working with neutron reflectometry ever since then. Uh, today I work at ESS, uh, actually in the deuteration uh, platform DMAX. And um, even though Tommy promised you lipolytic enzymes in, in the title, I, I think I would like to concentrate mainly on uh, membrane deuteration and, and the creation of internal contrast uh, uh, with a few examples, uh, including some enzymes, uh, of how this is used in neutron reflectometry. Uh, I particularly would like to um, try to impress you with the ability uh, of deuteration to allow us to see inside even single lipid bilayers um, in a way that's quite different to what Tony will have just told you about NMR and uh, neutron reflectometry are very complementary in, in, in the sense that they both give information about this environment, uh, but the nature of the information is, is very different. And neutrons can, uh, can scatter from inside the membrane uh, because of their properties. Um, this can of course also be done by X-rays, but it's the deuteration that gives uh, neutrons uh, the unique power uh, to look at things uh, with internal contrast. So that's the main theme of today's talk. Uh, specifically, we will look at um, what is contrast variation in membrane samples, uh, why do you do it, and how do you do it? Uh, this uh, mainly uh, relates to the deuteration of membrane lipids. So I'll tell you about how lipids can be deuterated, uh, and also what can be done today, what kind of lipids can you get? Uh, and also a little bit about where you can get them from. Then uh, this contrast variation and deuteration um, has quite an impact on your data analysis. You get much more out of it, but you also need to make some extra considerations because of it. So I'll walk you through some of the things that you need to know and some of the things you need to do in order to make the most of, of your deuteration. And then I have uh, three examples that I hope will be illustrative so that you get an idea of the kinds of things that you can resolve by using this internal membrane contrast. Uh, I chose to do this so that you could get some understanding of how you might be able to use this in your research um, later on, uh, instead of giving you a long, long literature review of uh, too many examples to remember or, or know how exactly they were done. So I'll have all the way through this uh, kind of a tutorial approach of, of trying to give you an understanding of also how things are done in addition to what, what results you can get. Uh, and the contrast being the subject matter, I pull out my most favorite far side cartoon, which illustrates the point quite well that we are trying to do what Lola has achieved here. In many cases, we are trying to make some things invisible, uh, while other things we would like to create contrast to in order to see them better. Uh, in this case, Harold was a bit unlucky because he was eaten by the monster, but uh, the picture shows very well what neutron contrast variation is about. Uh, it's about making the object of your interest visible. And there are three different ways in which we can do contrast variation uh, for neutron reflectometry. Uh, the first two apply equally well to uh, small angle scattering. Um, the first one and most commonly used is uh, solvent contrast variation, which means that we take exactly the same sample uh, and we measure it in uh, solvents that are deuterated to different degrees. So you will have seen this probably in the SANS lectures too. Uh, and by doing so, we can basically solve the phase problem, at least partially, uh, and, and determine the scattering length density profile of, of the sample, in this case, a lipid membrane. Uh, usually it's overall structure because you won't have any contrast between the things that are inside. Uh, and usually we get from this uh, where the solvent is, uh, where the hydration water is in relation to the membrane lipids. Uh, if you have more than one component in your membranes uh, and you want to distinguish between those two, that's when the membrane deuteration really comes into play. That in multi component membranes, uh, by selectively deuterating uh, some components or one component uh, in turn, uh, you can actually work out the composition of the membrane and also the distribution of the components, whether they're inside or, or above. Uh, but you still need to combine this uh, with the solvent contrast variation to determine where the solvent is. Um, so you can already begin to understand that there are many levels of, of analysis that you can do and, uh, and many things to consider. There is also something called magnetic contrast variation that can be done with polarized neutron beams. 
and I'm not really going to go into this today, but I think it's worth mentioning. Um, it's possible to uh, create a support structure for supported lipid bilayers uh, in which underneath the surface there is a magnetic layer that's composed of a permalloy that actually has a different scattering length density to polarize neutrons depending on the spin orientation. So whether the spins are up or down relative to the surface. Um, and, and this gives you two different measurement contrasts, uh, although uh, it doesn't really give you the ability to contrast match anything because the scattering length densities of the permalloy are quite high in relation to what you might have in a sample. This one is an antibody array, for example. Um, but it does give you two contrasts and partially solves the phase problem. It's particularly good for systems where you cannot, for one reason or another, exchange the solvent to do solvent contrast variation, for example, because something like an antibody array is so weakly bound to that some of it is removed if you change the solvent. Um, but if you want to do internal contrast, you still need to combine this with either A and or B uh, to get a clear picture of what it is that the sample membrane contains on top of this uh, uh, magnetic layer. Uh, polarized neutron measurements take longer than normal ones because you need to take two measurements basically. And the beam is usually also a slightly less intense. But it's, it's worth knowing that, that this possibility exists. So today I'll be mainly focusing on, on, on B, the membrane deuteration, and, and what you can do with it. Uh, so for that, we look at lipid deuteration, uh, because that is probably uh, uh, the most common way in which uh, things are deuterated for membrane samples. It's possible to deuterate uh, lipids uh, either biologically by enzyme catalysis or by conventional organic synthetic chemistry. Uh, they all do different things and achieve different things, so that's the thing here to uh, concentrate on. So by organic synthesis it's possible to make uh, pure molecular species of, for example, phospholipids in milligram to up to gram quantities partially or completely deuterated or contrast matched to, for example, D2O. Um, but the lipids are complex molecules and so are the synthesis groups. So this is quite laborious. Um, what you see on, on the right here in red are some of the molecules that have been synthesized that are, and are available, uh, and they're not so many. So mainly phosphatidylcholine, PC lipids, uh, different types of glycerolipids, tridye and monoglycerides, uh, and they are, of course, all made from fatty acids, uh, where mainly saturated fatty acids are made. And I think oleic acid is the only deuterated unsaturated fatty acid that I know that's been synthesized chemically. I recently heard that there was an example of a head group deuterated phosphatidylglycerol lipid made at ANSTO, but I need to check whether this is actually the case or if I misunderstood something. Um, Enzyme catalysis is something that we've taken as our thing at ESS because uh, it can potentially shorten the synthesis routes to pure molecular phospholipids uh, that in deuterated form uh, because enzymes have very high regio and, and antiospecificity. Uh, so this means that you can bi bypass a lot of the steps that you do in normal chemical synthesis. And you can also immobilize enzymes on different types of support to uh, reuse them as catalysts and increase the yield. So far, we have managed to make POPC and POPE uh, in chain deuterated forms. Then biological deuteration lipids uh, can be done in cell cultures because several types of microorganisms grow in deuterated media. Uh, it's important that this is minimal media, as you probably will have heard from the other speakers already, uh, so that you don't have to add um, deuterated amino acids into the growth medium, which gets uh, very difficult very soon. And this way, you can also produce something like 10 to 500 milligrams of biological lipid mixtures quite routinely. Uh, and they will have the native fatty acyl chain distribution and, and all the different uh, lipid classes that are present in the cell culture. They can be made completely deuterated, partially deuterated, or even in contrast matched forms. Uh, but this comes with the necessity of uh, purification and separation of what it is that you need ultimately by chromatography. So uh, other things can be used, but primarily uh, yeast and E. coli bacterial cultures have been used to produce uh, phospholipid extracts and also some glycerol lipids um, that they contain. Uh, and uh, the sterols um, are quite easy to separate from the other nonpolar lipids. Uh, in blue, you see the phospholipid classes um, and the sterols that have been purified uh, from the rest. So purified phosphatidylcholine mixtures have been made, and I think also cardiolipin uh, now, in addition to purified ergosterol and cholesterol. 
Uh, but the, the separation of the components is, is here what remains the challenge if you don't want to use the native whole lipid extract that comes from the cells. So let's look at uh, some of the things related to organic synthesis. Um, all lipids uh, are made from uh, different types of uh, elements. Uh, the largest components are the fatty acyl chains. Uh, and uh, the saturated ones are easy to make in a hydrothermal reaction in a power reactor that you can see here on the right side. It takes some time, uh, could be uh, up to a week or a couple of weeks uh, to achieve a very high deuteration. Um, but anything that has an unsaturation or anything else that's interesting does not survive the conditions in this reactor, so it has to be chemically synthesized afterwards. Uh, so that's why so few unsaturated fatty acids are available deuterated. You can see here the example of the oleic acid synthesis uh, on the left here, uh, and even that, just making the oleic fatty acid um, is quite complicated. You have to make two different fatty acids deuterated, then you have to combine them specifically into a cis geometry, uh, and uh, the overall yield of this process is quite low, and one of the intermediates, this uh, aldehyde, is terribly unstable. So this is generally thought of as quite a difficult process. Um, it was published by Ansto uh, already in 2013 for the first time, and they're very good at making this on a large scale, which is available from them. Uh, but recently, biologically deuterated oleic acid, um, that is actually per deuterated, is also be available from Sigma Aldrich or nowadays Merck for uh, something like 3000 euros per gram. So uh, we haven't tried how much of it you can get from them. It may be that there is a supply issue if everybody suddenly starts ordering hundreds of grams. Um, but the cost is, uh, is not that uh, not significant, especially when you compare it to what you then have to do afterwards if you want to synthesize phospholipids from oleic acid and other fatty acids. And this is the example of the synthesis of POPC uh, that was done at the National Australian Deuteration Facility um, in Sydney uh, for, for this neutron study for which we actually traveled to Australia with Robin and, and Wolfgang to, to do the experiments. Uh, the synthesis of uh, POPC with two different fatty acid chains means that you have to combine two different fatty acids, palmitic and oleic, uh, with the glycerol that needs to be deuterated and with the choline head group that has to be synthesized in deuterated form uh, until you get to the end. The percentages here are the, the yields of the different reactions and you realize that once you've gone through all of, this, all of these processes, uh, a gram of oleic acid does not give a gram of deuterated POPC. Uh, this is normally done on a scale of uh, 100 milligrams or a few hundred milligrams uh, at a time. Uh, and that is uh, sufficient for many experiments. Why such a lipid is very nice when it is completely deuterated is that it's a very high contrast to almost anything that you would like to put in it, where also the head groups are, uh, have a contrast to even D2O, they are so deuterated. Then we started studying the use of lipolytic enzymes um, at ESS, thanks to two of these uh, European grants that uh, we were part of, um, because um, enzymes are first of all nice in the sense that they make few byproducts, so you simplify purifications. The reaction conditions are usually mild, uh, so this is nice and green. Um, and because they're so highly specific, this shortens the reaction sequence that you usually need to carry out. Uh, and the immobilization of enzyme is quite well understood. Uh, so for lipids, uh, the interesting thing is that there are several different lipolytic enzymes that uh, act on different parts of a phospholipid molecule where they either can be uh, used to remove the choline, the entire head group, uh, one or both of the uh, fatty acyl chains. Sorry, I don't know why this is jumping. <laughs> Uh, and quite specifically, on, they only act in those positions specifically. Uh, and so uh, we were looking at developing methods by which we can specifically swap deuterated fatty acid chains for hydrogenous fatty acids uh, in phospholipids to, to make the synthesis uh, faster. Uh, commercially, there are lipases that attack the one position and phospholipase A2 that are available. Uh, ours came from Novozymes as a gift. Uh, this sounds all very well, nice and well, uh, and this example of uh, uh, deuterated POPC uh, also looks quite simple, that you first uh, take a, a lysolipid that only has one chain, um, and then you put on a deuterated oleic acid chain in the two position, 
and then you remove the undeuterated palmitic acid chain that was there uh, and you replace it with the deuterated palmitol chain ending up with the chain deuterated POPC. Uh, but the reaction is complicated. We are making the enzymes work in two directions here. One, the hydrolysis direction, which is what they normally do, and also in the reverse direction in esterification. So controlling the enzyme and water activity is something that is very strict in here. And also lipids are soluble in, uh, and not soluble in water, and the enzyme is. So these are biphasic reactions. And we also need to monitor what is going on and, 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 and follow the um, how efficiently you've uh, immobilized the enzyme, for example, and how well it still, still works afterwards. In many cases, the lipids that you buy contain significant byproducts. Uh, for example, commercial POPC is up to 20% OPPC, uh, where acyl migration has changed the positions of the chains. Um, ours is a lot purer than that because this uh, enzymatic esterification is much, much more specific and less susceptible to this acyl migration. So. This involves doing a whole lot of different types of analysis to verify that everything is where it's supposed to be and everything is as deuterated as it's supposed to be. So we have after this also made a similar, similar version of POPE uh, chain deuterated at ESS. And biologically, um, I said yeast is one of the organisms that is used for doing this. Um, the reason is that um, uh, Pichia pastoris uh, yeast is a uh, kind of industrially used uh, yeast for protein production uh, and it tolerates uh, D2O very well uh, and it can live on glycerol as the only carbon source and doesn't need any other um, foods that are other than minerals. Uh, so glycerol, deuterated glycerol is, uh, is what is used to create the deuteration in lipids. The lipids are synthesized primarily, primarily from, from that. Uh, depending on uh, how much lipids you need, um, you can grow them either in flasks or in bioreactors and you can get something in the region of hundreds of milligrams to grams of deuterated lipids uh, quite easily. Um, the reason why Pichia pastoris turns out to be interesting, uh, in addition to being useful, is that it, it has uh, these desaturated enzymes that most other yeasts have lost. Uh, and it can produce uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids in quite a reasonable amount. Uh, you can see here on the right hand side the uh, phospholipid composition and the fatty acid composition of both deuterated and normal hydrogenous yeast grown at 30 degrees, I think it was. Um, the phospholipid composition is uh, preserved in D2O, uh, but the fatty acyl composition is changed uh, so that fewer polyunsaturated lipids are produced and, and a lot more uh, oleic acid chains are produced in D2O. We know that this is because of this kind of uh, genetic isotope effect, uh, both on the growth rate of the cells, but also on the reaction rate of these uh, desaturase enzymes that progressively work from oleic acid to create first linoleic and then linolenic acids. Uh, but this difference can be reduced if you if you change the growth temperature of the of the cultures to lower temperatures. Um, if you want to uh, use lipids that are deuterated like this biologically, um, they come as a mixture of all the lipids that are in the cell, uh, which you need to extract. Um, the main problem here is that lipids are not overexpressed by the cells. Um, phospholipids, uh, they are part of the cell structure. You cannot make too many of them before things go wrong. Uh, some glycerol lipids can be overexpressed in the sense that they are storage fats. Uh, and some, uh, some kinds of organisms can grow a lot of oils. Uh, but in general, you have to grow a lot of cells to get a reasonable quantity of lipids uh, and go through this procedure of extraction and chromatographic separation. And also quite detailed analysis to understand what it is that you have because the growth conditions also when you harvest cells have an effect on, on the composition of the lipids. Here you see in this graph, uh, quite a recent analysis of uh, the fatty acyl composition of Vicia pastoris phospholipids. Uh, separate, uh, where you can see all the different classes that we've separated by um, thin layer chromatography. Uh, and each class has its own profile of, uh, of uh, fatty acids. Um, the phosphodiol ethanol means being more, most unsaturated uh, with cardiolipin uh, and the PC fraction being the most saturated fraction, for example. So, uh, uh, knowing what you have in your experiments is important both from a biophysical and biochemical point of view, but also for the analysis that you have later. Uh, as is the degree of deuteration, so quite often uh, part of this information comes, for example, from uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, for example, the deuteration of ergosterol was uh, verified 
uh, by us like this. Uh, and the rest is often coming from uh, NMR, uh, looking at the uh, deuteration across the chains. Um, e. coli, I forgot to mention one thing, which is that it is also possible to produce um, sterols like ergosterol, which yeast has naturally. It's not difficult to purify, uh, but also cholesterol, um, because there is an engineered yeast strain that is used at the ILL. Uh, a, a recombinant PIKIA strain that is able to make cholesterol instead of ergosterol. So due to per edit sterols are actually possible to make. Uh, another modification that has been made in E. coli is that it's been adapted to produce PC lipids, which normally does not make at all. It normally only makes PE, cardiolipin and PG. Uh, and, and this is something that was done by um, the ILL in collaboration with uh, Selma Marik. Uh, where they could also show that by selectively feeding uh, the cultures um, combinations of hydrogenated and deuterated glycerol and choline for the head groups, uh, this kind of B2O contrast matched lipids can be produced that uh, make completely invisible nanodisks for membrane proteins um, in D2O. Uh, but these lipids are also, they come as a mixture of, of all the different fatty acid chains and combinations where the uh, PO PO chains are the predominant, um, but there's also a fraction of this uh, uh, strange cyclolipid that's specific um, to this organism. Uh, and, and so what you always get is, is, is still a mixture, even if you separate the PC fraction into the different chain lengths by reverse phase chromatography, and these two are um, near to impossible to separate from each other. Then if we take a look at a little bit about what this is all for, um, it's really about the fact that uh, in, in neutron experiments, the deuteration of your sample not only affects the signal that you have uh, in your experiments, which is represented here by simulation of the different degrees of deuteration in a membrane. Uh, what you normally get out of an analysis like this is, is just the scattering length density profile, which is this black line here. Uh, uh, but what you want to know is, is what is the structure of my lipid bilayer? Uh, so, so you have to be able to interpret this. Uh, and the idea of solvent contrast variation is that you identify uh, the solvent and also where all the different components are. So in this hypothetical example of two, lip two uh, component membrane where one lipid is deuterated, uh, you see in D2O uh, the hydrogenous lipids uh, and you get uh, one scattering curve. Uh, if you change the solvent to H2O, you see only the deuterated lipids and you get a completely different scattering. Curve. And it's by analyzing those two together uh, that you derive the scattering length density profile. But then besides this, there is still much more to do. And that comes to uh, being able to interpret the scattering length density profile. So here uh, we're going to look a little bit on um, what is it that you need to know in order to be able to analyze your data and, and what you need to do uh, in, order to, uh, in order to get the results out and interpret them. So you need to know the scattering length density that you expect your molecule or your molecules, if it's a mixture, to have. And that includes knowing the degree of deuteration. Things are not always 100% deuterated. They can be 95% deuterated, and that's more than enough. Uh, sometimes they're selectively deuterated, uh, like this lipid here is only chain deuterated, but not head deuterated. Uh, and you need to know uh, the molecular structure. Uh, you need to know either the molecular volume or, or the density, um, because the scattering length density is the sum of the uh, nuclear scattering lengths for every atom uh, divided by the molecular volume, if it's the molecular scattering length, length density that you want. Uh, and the same thing for these different groups. If you want to know the chain scattering length density, you want to know the volume of the lipid chains. So how do you, how do you know this? Um, uh, there are uh, quite a lot of, um, examples of data that have been used and then many of much of it comes from, for example, X-ray diffraction and neutron diffraction measurements uh, or density measurements. Um, but it's becoming more and more common that the volumes of the different lipid groups are derived from molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, here is a, the, probably the earliest example where this was done on purpose to compare to X-ray uh, diffraction data uh, to derive actually the component specific volumes of, of all the groups along the lipid chains and, and the head groups in comparison to this, this experimental data, if it's interesting for you to look at. And the, 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 they correlate quite well in, in the overall volume. 
So, so this kind of information is quite frequently used to compute scattering length densities. But it's important to understand that it is the, the right molecule and it is the right conditions and also what is the uncertainty inherent in, in the data that you're using as well as the analysis that you're doing. So in addition to this, there are a number of things that you need to understand about the uh, sample geometry uh, and, um, uh, and what you're analyzing. So uh, in order to make sure that your analysis gives a physically realistic structure, we normally use constraints um, that relate to the structure of the molecules that we are analyzing. For example, uh, if it's a lipid bilayer, then the area, the molecule for the head group and the lipid tails should be the same. Otherwise, it's not a bilayer. It's some kind of curved structure if the area is larger at the heads or the tails. So that's typically a constraint that is applied. Uh, what does that have to do with um, scattering length densities? You, you wonder. Uh, normally, uh, it's also used in combination of constraining the amounts of solvent present, uh, because that is what affects the volume fractions of the lipids in different areas. Um, it has something to do with fitting because this is what the data normally looks like uh, from your analysis. This is uh, it, it is real data relating to DMPC, but I've made up the errors to uh, to to make a point. Um, uh, from this data, you would like to understand that the structure is realistic, so you can compute the area per molecule uh, from knowing the molecular volume and and taking the lipid volume fraction uh, and dividing by the thickness of each layers. Um, and, and, and that's all very well. The reason why you use two contrasts is that if you have two contrasts, you can say that all the structural parameters must be the same. The only thing you are changing is the scattering length density of the water. Uh, so that is uh, an, a major constraint. But the interesting thing here in this table is the errors. The parameters are all the same, but the numbers for the errors are different between H2O and D2O. And that relates to the sensitivity of each contrast to the parameters that you are fitting. That very much depends on what is the chemical composition or the deuteration of your molecules uh, and the solvent contrast. So D2O is better at determining some things, while H2O is better at determining other things in this case. And what matters in the end is, is the parameters that you're interested in. So in this case, the area of a molecule uh, is calculated to be the same uh, everywhere, uh, but the errors in the H2O data in this case are smaller. So that is what determines uh, your fit, basically the best contrast. I should add here that the area of a molecule is this uh, one that actually includes all the solvent that is present uh, and is used to ensure that the space filling and the bilayer geometry also works from, from that point of view. Um, it means that there are two tails per every head and not necessarily that there are exactly the same number of molecules on both sides of the membrane. So then I told you that it's possible to obtain deuterated biological lipid mixtures. Um, how does one do that for those? Is it even possible to do this kind of analysis if you have a total lipid extract from some organism that makes all kinds of things? Uh, yes, it is, um, uh, with a pinch of salt, which I will add at the end. Um, so these are the Pikia pastoris uh, phospholipids, or so some of them, where it makes several different head groups. Uh, they can be either deuterated or undeuterated, depending on which ones you want to use. Or if you're really unlucky, your supervisor has asked you to mix some of each, and then you have both. Um, uh, and you know from analysis, you know the phospholipid composition. Unfortunately, the head groups are polar, <coughs> and all of them except for the phosphatidylcholine group also exchange protons with the solvent. So they all have a different scattering length density in different solvents, depending on the degree of deuteration. So I've shown you here for four different ones. But yes, if you know the composition, it is possible to calculate the average head group scattering length density and also calculate how much it varies across different contrasts uh, in the solvent. And this is important because the differences are large enough uh, to, to be meaningful in your data analysis. It is not possible usually to try to analyze the data with uh, a single number in all the contrasts. And if the fatty acid chain composition has been analyzed, uh, you can also uh, calculate a scattering length density for the chains that are deuterated and non-deuterated. Thankfully, this does not change with the solvent. Here, the Pikia pastoris example is interesting because uh, all of the polyunsaturated fatty acids mean that the scattering length density in both hydrogenous and deuterated molecules is actually higher than what you would get for POPC. 
So if you try to use values for POPC as the uh, standard membrane phospholipid uh, representative, uh, it will go wrong. Uh, it's actually uh, next to impossible to fit uh, data from Pigia Pastoris lipids using the scattering length densities for this average lipid POPC. Uh, so yes, you can calculate all of this, but, uh, but in the estimation of the scattering length density, you still need the information about the uh, molecular volumes. Uh, and this analysis relies on you being able to use a source for the molecular volumes that is at least of the same level of accuracy as the analysis that you're doing. And that, that's the take home point. Uh, here we use these types of molecular dynamic simulations values that were derived from POPC. So it is not exactly the same molecule, um, uh, but uh, to the accuracy of neutron reflection, being able to determine the scattering length density, uh, where there is always an inherent error, uh, the potential systematic molecular volume error uh, does not count. It is uh, considerably smaller or at least not larger. So that's the sort of consideration that you would want to take if you're using uh, some of these assumptions. Uh, when it comes to analyzing data, it's more than possible to analyze data from even very complex mixtures as long as you know these numbers that you need to describe the molecules. Uh, so you see in an example <coughs> exactly this Pikia pastoris lipid bilayer uh, in a six layer structure because there is also an additional molecule called amphotericin B uh, on top. Uh, so there are layers that describe the scattering length densities, thickness, roughness uh, and the solvent content of every layer. Uh, and they are all constrained to be the same in all contra contrast except the lipid head groups uh, that change with the solvent. And in fact, uh, the lipid chain region, because it contains some of this amphotericin B, uh, which uh, exchanges with the solvent. So this is an example that I will show you towards the end. And in the end, you, you refine a fit until all different solvent contrasts fit hopefully equally well. Um, so and, and, and you do this calculation for the areas per molecule to the degree that it's possible to understand that you're still modeling a physically realistic structure. Then I promised some more enzymes. Uh, this example is very old. Uh, this is in fact the experiment that Tommy was referring to, one of my first at the ILL, uh, that was looking at the um, reaction of phospholipase A2 with lipid bilayers, um, because it is uh, what's called an interfacial enzyme. Uh, the reaction rate uh, of this reaction in which it splits lipids into two parts is something like 10,000 times faster uh, on a lipid membrane surface compared to monomeric short chain lipids that are free in solution. So in this situation, understanding the crystal structure or the catalytic site mechanism of the enzyme does not nearly describe to you how its activity is regulated because it depends very much on, on the surface of the membrane. So the interest is here to understand what happens during this reaction in a membrane when the membrane, the, when the enzyme interacts with the lipids and they are converted into lysolipids and fatty acids. The enzyme is, is very, very um, widely distributed in different biological systems. It's in our digestion, it's part of the inflammatory cascade, it's in a lot of venoms like this cobra venom that I studied, and it also participates in cell signaling through these lipid messengers. I think this was the first example, and probably one of the few existing examples of intramolecular uh, contrast variation, uh, where a half deuterated POPC is in principle split into a deuterated half and a non-deuterated half by the phospholipase A2. So by using this uh, and the understanding that both the lysolipid and the fatty acid should be more water soluble uh, than the phospholipid, uh, the neutron reflection should be able to tell us something about what happens to these uh, two reaction product molecules. Uh, and so it does, it told us something that was a bit surprising, but with hindsight, maybe not so much. Um, if one looks at the hydrolysis of pure POPC, um, the reflectivity drops in a way that tells us that about half of the lipid membrane is destroyed and solubilized away by phospholipase A2. Okay, that would suggest that half the membrane is digested. If we take this half deuterated molecule and do exactly the same measurement, the, the results and the curves look different. Uh, the results say that the amount of lipid doesn't really change. Uh, the membrane just gets a little bit thinner so these are two analyses um, where we did not refine to the same structure because they were two different samples, but 
we refine to the same uh, global uh, phenomenon, if you like. So the same thing has to happen in both samples. In case of the half deuterated molecule, well, yes, the thinning corresponds to about the thickness of the lipid head groups, but not much else seems to happen. And the only way this is consistent with the data from the unlabeled molecule is that uh, it is the uh, deuterated half of the molecule that is solubilized and taken away because it is invisible in the D2O contrast. And you, the only thing that you see is the hydrogenous fatty acid parts uh, that are not solubilized and they stay where they were before. Now, those measurements were quite long. You can see the measurement times were hours um, today. And already some years ago, it's been possible to do much faster measurements, for example, at the ILL on the newer, newer reflectometers like Figaro, where and the, this example is from like two minute measurements per curve. So there is already an ability to some degree to follow enzyme kinetics as a function of time. Uh, what you want to do for structural analysis is that you want to measure quite a broad uh, Q range, a broad scattering angle range, uh, so that you can make a structural model and, and fit, for example, the shape changes to the uh, changes in the membrane structure. Um, at the ESS, uh, my legacy will be the design of the Freya reflectometer that was actually made for this kind of uh, purpose uh, uh, in the end. Um, it's a very fast instrument that measures a very broad Q range simultaneously. So when it is finally available, um, it should be measure should be able to measure something like sub-second time scales when ESS is at its full power. Uh, in the in the early days when ESS is at half power, I'm sure the speed will always always already be at the second time scale. Then my second example is is looking at membrane asymmetry, which was uh, was also related to a question that I caught towards the end of um, Tony's talk. Um, uh, selective deuteration is a good way to actually look inside a membrane and see whether there is an asymmetry uh, and other uh, inhomogeneities in the distribution of molecules. Uh, asymmetric bilayers can be made on solid supports on purpose by langmuir blodgett deposition, for example, uh, but sometimes it happens on its own because of the properties of the molecules. And um, we've been doing studies that involve using uh, cardiolipin for some time uh, for the purpose of studying uh, mitochondrial membrane models. Um, actually in collaboration also with Gerhard Gröbner from UMO. Um, this is a different example though, um, where cardiolipin is negatively charged uh, and it's repelled by the negatively charged silicon dioxide spots that are used for the membranes. Um, and if one mixes it with deuterated POPC, uh, it's not very surprising that the distribution of the cardiolipin turns out to be asymmetric. So that there is more of the cardiolipin towards the solution where there is no negatively charged surface than on the surface side. Asymmetry is not very pronounced. There is like 30% on the outside and 13% on the inside where the nominal composition was um, 20 volume percent, which corresponds to the 10 mole percent of cardiolipin. Um, but even, even such a low level asymmetry is quite easily resolved uh, in a measurement using four solvent contrasts uh, and this uh, one deuterated lipid. Uh, the same. Uh, happens in systems where we've looked at where ubiquinone uh, goes. Uh, it's a very long hydrophobic molecule. It's actually longer than the thickness of the typical lipid bilayer. And it's an electron acceptor for many enzymes in mitochondria. And this implies that it needs to be able to go to where all these many enzymes are. Uh, and with neutron reflection in these same membranes with deuterated POPC and cardiolipin, we can quite easily show that uh, ubiquinone actually sits exclusively in the center of lipid bilayers in its own layer that's about four or five angstroms thick and about 50% of the volume is definitely made of ubiquinone uh, that we can see when we use deuterated POPC. So many details can be resolved even in relatively small layers inside a membrane when, when the uh, compositional difference is large enough. Um, so this could be potentially used to detect many other molecules. Uh, something that I've been working on for quite a few years now is amphotericin B. That is an antimycotic antibiotic, so it works against uh, fungi and uh, some parasites and mold, I believe. Um, and it's a membrane binding antibiotic that inserts into lipid bilayers. It works by binding um, ergosterol uh, that is only found in, in these uh, fungal organisms. 
uh, why it's an interesting example here is that exchanges a very large number of protons with the solvent. So the exchange of amphotericin scattering length density is pronounced going from H2O to D2O. It has good contrast to nearly all solvent contrast, except the silicon supports and, and the water match to it where it is as good as invisible. Um, so this scattering length density change across the solvents was actually large enough for us to be able to detect its insertion into membranes where the lipid scattering length density does not change with the solvent contrast. And here is uh, the earliest example of that, where we looked at both these hydrogenous and third deuterated PKF storage lipids that we uh, extracted, uh, either with uh, either having removed the natural ergosterol present uh, or, or uh, with it still there. Uh, and uh, it's quite easy to build supported bilayers from these things nowadays, but it took some learning. Um, you might ask as the first thing, why is there a difference in thickness between the red ones and the blue ones? Aren't they both yeast lipids? Um, yes, they are. But if you remember the um, analysis that I showed you, which said that the deuterated yeasts make fewer polyunsaturated lipids, um, that's the difference. Um, the polyunsaturated lipids that are present in the hydrogenous yeast, normally they, they make the membrane quite a lot thinner. Uh, and, and, we, and the sterols, as they normally do, they, they thicken the membrane somewhat. Uh, but this effect is much more pronounced in the polyunsaturated membrane than in the uh, largely monounsaturated deuterated membrane. Amphotericin B, what it does is this creates um, this kind of um, layer that is as thick as the membrane on the outside, but that is very hydrated. Uh, it inserts into the lipid bilayers. It's visible in both hydrogenous and deuterated lipids. Uh, and the interesting thing is that we can see it extracting ergosterol into this amphotericin layer. The scattering length density of this layer changes uh, most dramatically when the ergosterol is deuterated ergosterol that is pulled out. Uh, and, and, and quite a significant thinning happens in the polyunsaturated membranes when the ergosterol is removed. It goes more or less to the same value as the membrane that didn't have any ergosterol to begin with. So this is probably one of the most complex examples that I have studied. Um, uh, but you can see that many things can be unraveled. The last example uh, is where we actually used some uh, strains which certain genes were used to, certain genes were up or down regulated uh, to change um, their, basically their function um, that made them uh, in some cases amphotericin resistant and some cases more susceptible to amphotericin. Um, the lipid composition changes uh, mainly related to the accumulation of squalene, which is the precursor to all sterols, including ergosterol. Uh, so we were able to study um, where the squalene is also in the center of membranes and, and what it does to the uh, ability of amphotericin to extract ergosterol, um, where we could identify the deuterated ergosterol quite clearly also as a drop in reflectivity. It turns out that the squalene in the center of the membranes block and blocks amphotericin, it can't go through, and it is only able to extract the ergosterol from the outside of the supported lipid bilayers. Uh, and the, the, the way in which this happens is cor correlates um, with the resistance uh, in, in the strains that were created by RNA interference in this case. So to conclude quickly, um, lipid deuteration is a powerful tool to understand membrane structure and function. Um, lots of different lipids can already be deuterated uh, in different ways. Um, there are different advantages to synthesis and biology. Uh, but uh, both of them have challenges, and uh, I would say that uh, they are both equally costly. Uh, there is a certain cost involved in deuteration, and it, the, in the end, the way in which you do it, it doesn't really make any difference. Uh, but that analysis of your deuteration degree, the purity of your compounds, and the molecular composition of mixtures is extremely important for you to be able to use this in, uh, in, in your neutron scattering uh, analysis. And deuteration really allows you to exploit the power of neutron reflectometry and SANS to the full, um, in that it can reveal all these details about the internal membrane structure and, and composition. Um, but it's important to remember that the analysis is only as good as the information and assumptions that you put in yourself. Uh, so this is something to remember. 
I would just like to conclude by showing you what is already available at ESS, because some of you said in your letters of motivation that you'd like to know what will be at ESS. Um, the deuteration and crystallization service for proteins is already in operation and has been since 2019. Um, you can see here the gang of people working. There's myself and Anna Liang, who work in the chemical deuteration lab in Medicon Village. Uh, we've had help from Fatima this year, and we have two postdocs uh, on um, uh, grants with Lund University, Yendi working on lipids and Jai Fei on synthesis of surfactants. Um, then we have a biological deuteration lab that is actually based at the uh, LP3 protein production platform at Lund University, um, where Zoe and a biotechnician do um, the biological cell growth and also purifications of proteins and, and crystallization of proteins, including some testing and data collection with X-rays at the MAX4. The platform is run by the other Knecht that you may recognize. Um, if you have any questions, um, we have run proposal calls already twice um, to basically learn how to manage proposals and um, what molecules we need to be able to try. It. Uh, there will be at least one more of these before ES becomes operational, um, but the date is not yet been determined. So if you have questions, you're more than welcome to email us at, at this address. Uh, we are not alone. There are many other deuteration facilities in the world, and we're actually organized into DUNET as an international deuteration network. Um, that is uh, still coordinated uh, by me at ESS. Um, but we have grown from a European uh, grant collaboration uh, uh, in 2015 uh, to a worldwide network where we have members from the American, the Australian, and also the Asian uh, neutron facilities, and also some university laboratories where uh, deuteration is used, for example, in drug studies. We have our own homepage, uh, and you're welcome to go and see what we who we are and what we do, and we also have a Twitter account where we occasionally publicize what we are doing. I would just like to conclude by saying that there is also a book that I wrote uh, a few years ago with my colleagues from ESS that describes some of these deuteration methods, um, also lists a lot of the, almost all of the instruments in the world where you can do neutron reflection and SANS and other experiments uh, or, uh, in life science research. Uh, so it may be something that's interesting for you to check out. And I'd be happy to take any questions if you have. So thank you very many, uh, much, Hanna, for this very clear uh, presentation. So do we have any? Uh, I have a lot of clapping hands here. So, so your contribution was very much appreciated. Yeah. So I is there any? Sharing uh, to see you better. <laughs> <laughs> is there any? Um, oh, any uh, questions? For Hannah, please go ahead. This is the chance to get your favorite uh, devturated lipids. I have a question, Anna. Uh, in one of the last slides that you showed, uh, you said that uh, this um, amphoterosin B, like it, it extracts uh, ergosterol and puts it in a sponge phase, or like it, it takes it out of the membrane and keeps it in the solution. I didn't follow uh, that part. Yes, so well, we can go back to the presentation to show you. Um, yes, it, it, it um, binds ergosterol. This was known, mm -hmm. um, but uh, what was not known, uh, what, what, what happens? Does the complex stay in the membrane? It was thought to form pores, mm -hmm. um, but what we could show was that it, it, this is not the case. It actually, the ergosterol comes out. It's quite clear from the deuteration. Okay. Uh, that uh, that this this happens and then the sponge layer is just a name that was given to the uh, to this uh, extra membrane layer by uh, some other people who discovered it uh, without okay. really uh, using aqueous conditions to show that it's something that just gets spilled on on the surface of of the membrane uh, and stays there with the ergosterol and uh, and what with the, the lanosterol does it uh, like uh, does it have any effect with uh... Does it work uh, yeah, we yeah, um, lanosterol accumulates. It's it's the last precursor to ergosterol mm. um, mm. in the synthesis. Uh, we've done also some experiments with we've put lanosterol specifically in the membranes, and, and it turns out that uh, amphotericin doesn't do anything to the lanosterol. Uh, and same thing with cholesterol. It's able to go to the membranes and bind cholesterol, but it doesn't is not able to pull the cholesterol out the same way as ergosterol. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? I think Nicola has a question. Hello. Uh, hello, 
yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. So I would like to ask you when you do um, neutron reflectometry, uh, how big is the area of the membrane of the surface that you are probing? And is it possible to like quantify your signal in some way? Like, is it done to know like how, how much or how many like uh, lipids are contributing to respective like signal? Okay. Um, yes, the, the area is quite large. Um, in most places where you go today, it's, it's off the order of, I would say, three centimeters by five or six centimeters. So it's quite a large area. Um, and, and the signal is um, averaged across the entire illumination area. We don't, in reflectometry, we don't have resolution to the lateral uh, distribution at all. Uh, what we get from these experiments, we get basically the density of lipid per unit area, uh, or the area per molecule, if you like, on, on the surface. So you can you can calculate how much how many lipids are in the illumination area if you know what it is. It's not 100% exact um, because the neutron beam is uh, is divergent. It it is possible to calculate the foot the complete footprint. And know it exactly but it's something you have to do separately just saying that the beam is this wide when it comes out of the beam hole it doesn't give you uh, the right answer but uh, in that sense yes it's possible and the lipids that contribute to the signal we're talking about uh, nanograms in a normal experiment still it's not mm -hmm. not that many thank you so much some more questions Sorry, for Hannah. i have one more question it's more oh, on Marie, the... go for it so uh, in one of these uh, experiments that you are using this cardiolipin, like, you know, you, I, I saw that you use 10% of cardiolipin with POPC. Uh, how did you manage to make the bilayer? Because I tried a lot, but it, uh, the vesicles never seems to burst on. Uh, <laughs> I tried it on, on QCM, uh, Thomas QCM. Yeah, okay. This, this, is, this is a bit of my, my speciality, knowing how to deposit vesicles in the bilayers. Um, so... For all negatively charged lipids, um, you need to do two things, which as a physical chemist, you might understand. Um, you, you need to screen the repulsion between the vesicles and the surface. Mm. Uh, if they're both negatively charged, then you, most often you do this by putting in sodium chloride mm. at something like physiological concentrations, so 100 millimoles or so. Yeah. Uh, and, and then the other thing that you need to do for negatively charged lipids uh, is that you need to add calcium, something divalent, divalent cation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's the exact mechanism of why it causes the membrane to form is this not certain, but uh, what I think is that it, it simply makes the lipid bilayer stable, the connection to, of the lipids between the surface, to the surface more stable so that the vesicles are able to break open and stay there. Uh, now this, uh, something like one to two millimolar calcium should be more than enough. Okay. Some cases we've also used magnesium chloride uh, but it's, uh, whenever you use calcium and magnesium, it causes problems in that all the vesicles want to aggregate together. So you have to be a little bit careful in how you how you how exactly you you do this. Okay. But um, do you add this in the buffer itself, like uh, yes. where you add the sodium chloride? Okay. Yeah. And then after you form the membrane, you, you can change the buffer to whatever yeah. you like. The mem once it's formed, the membrane is stable. Stable. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, any more questions for Hannah? Nobody more uh, want uh, more of depturated lipids. It's a chance. You get 5% off if you get I'm the, not sure get I can the produce course. them uh, on, <laughs> on the spot. And by the way, we don't we don't charge anything at ESS yeah. for the time being. It's uh, <laughs> while we are still learning, it's for free. <laughs> Hundred percent off. <laughs> Very cheap. Now I think it, it's. Oh, there is a hand there, Yen. Hi. Um, I have a kind of. Uh, I guess it's quite a simple question about the um, calculating SLDs. Uh, where you were saying that um, getting the correct density for each lipid is obviously very important, but um, the uh, for some of the less common lipids that the molecular volumes um, aren't really uh, well known or haven't been calculated. Um, but it's okay as long as it's within kind of experimental error. What kind of 
allowance do you have in the in the molecular volume that would still be okay with an experimental <laughs> error? Yeah, I, I think I, I worked that out once, which is uh, why I think I can say that um, it's, if, if you look at the scattering length densities, that if you're trying to, from your measurement, figure out what is my scattering length density, then it's not uh, unusual that the error in the number is something like plus or minus 0 0.1 or even 0 0.2. So, so that's the quantity that you're interested in. What am I able to determine from my measurement and data analysis? And if you convert that number into a, a molecular volume difference in the lipid chains, for example, and that, that's what gives you a feeling. So I think I worked it out that it's okay if the difference is up to something like 100 cubic angstroms between the value that you're using and the actual chain volume, and this really makes no difference at all. Uh, the, there is a difference between whether what contrast you're measuring so you always need to pick the most sensitive contrast so you get the smallest error to understand this, but uh, it's, it's in that ballpark. And often the values that you can use that probably are um, that, uh, that close or not very different. It's, it's, I, I think it's unlikely that you'll end up with much larger errors than that from using even the slightly wrong molecular dynamic simulations. <laughs>